Um, uh, we are absolutely pleased to have Dr. Moussa Diara from Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada here. He's a familiar face to most of or many of us. Uh, he's been here in Guelph for the last uh, few years or so, I believe since 2014, but he came from uh, Agassi. From Agassi, yeah. British Columbia. From British Columbia, I should have known that. <laughs> um, but, but he's been uh, working in, uh, in the area of food safety and antimicrobial resistance for many, many years. And um, he's also just recently joined us as a research scientist at the Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada lab just around the corner. And he's also been um, a, an adjunct professor here at the Department of Pathobiology. Uh, so Dr. Diara has completed his master's degree in animal science, and uh, which was followed by a PhD in microbiology and immunology from Laval University in Quebec. Uh, since 2002, mm -hmm. he's become a research scientist with Agri Ag Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada, and also he's held uh, numerous adjunct professorships with various different universities, including Kizar University. Uh, Dr. Diara's research is primarily focused on antimicrobial resistance, bacterial pathogenesis, and interactions between hosts and, and pathogens, and, and the development of novel alternatives to antibiotics in livestock and poultry. Musa has uh, been the leading uh, person for the poultry node of AFC's national uh, studies on AMR, and also he's been leading an organic science cluster project on uh, berry bases. Um, Musa has published numerous papers. He has co-authored three patents, and uh, he's also had 200 conferences and reports under his belt. Um, uh, without further ado, I'd like to ask Musa to give us a presentation on antibiotic resistance and broiler gut health. And thank you very much, Musa, for accepting our invitation. Thank you, uh, Sharian, and thank you, everyone. Uh, allow me to discuss some aspect of my research on, uh, in poultry. Uh, I would like to make connection between two topics that might not be a views for uh, everybody, but uh, I think after the presentation we will see if uh, they can fit together. Let's jump on to the presentation now. Feed additive. Uh, we will not be working, uh, talking specifically on feed additive today, but they are important. The aspect we are talking, touch feed additive. Some try to not put them together, but they are feed additive. Feed additive, in, by definition, anything you put in feed to increase in nutrition value or other property are, are feed additive. So they are used for different things to increase uh, palatability, improve nutrient availability. Talk about, think about enzyme. Reduce endotoxin and endogenous protein production, reduce inflammatory and gut permeability, etc., uh, etc. Et and uh, that is of my interest is inhibit pathogen growth. So they are antimicrobial. So if we talk about antimicrobial, that is all substance that inhibit or kill bacteria. But if you split that into you have antibiotic different to other antimicrobial. Antibiotic are those who have been synthesized by microorganisms like some uh, fungi, example is penicillin, streptomyces. Uh, those produce small molecules called antibiotic but kill or inhibit bacteria but doesn't have any effect on the host that has antibiotic. So, they have received attention since the ban of, or restriction, the ban is in Europe. Uh, restriction is Canada and, U, and uh, USA. Uh, in feed antibi antibiotic as growth promoter. <coughs> so, this is a kind of thing, uh, it's on my head, and I believe there are interactions between three different parts that determine the ecology of pathogen in animal or in poultry gut and their environment, but also that determine the profitability of the farmer. So those are chicken itself, feed, and antimicrobial, as we, that will be our main topic. So if you take chicken, you, you are different factor, genetics, line, 
you have different line of chicken. You have roast, cove, etc. Physiology study whether there are eggs in uh, embryonic uh, chicks or growing uh, chicken. Sex, that is female or male. Health, whether you have clinical or subclinical. Subclinical is of you to see, but subclinical you cannot see it, or it's very difficult to observe. Um, housing and husbanding are very important also for chicken. So let's go to the other one. Feed are the major entrant. So type of the feed, type of ingredient are using. Are they vegetarian or do they contain animal byproduct, etc., etc.? Do they contain enzyme, etc.? Or do they have fidelity? Nutrient contain and granulometry. Granulometry is the kind of feed how big particle feed up that determine the feed intake of chicken. Uh, nutrient content, we talk about protein, uh, carbohydrate, lipid, mineral, etc. Vitamin, energy level, as you say, the energy level of, of feed change when chicken grow smaller, it's called starter, grow and finisher. Some use pre-starter, starter, grow and finisher. Uh, palatability and availability, and for our talk, antimicrobial, very important class of antibiotic use. As you know, all antimicrobials are classified uh, by different, depending on their structure, but also depending on their mode of action. Spectrum, whether they cover one particular bacteria or where a broader bacteria, so such as gram-positive, gram-negative, and even in gram-positive, some, some antibiotics are not working for all gram-positive. Mode of action of antibiotic, the target, where you are, you want to target. For example, if you have kidney disease, do you give them orally or you want to go intramuscular or intravenous or all things like that? Uh, administration, the administration depends how long, how you administrate, how long you will be administrate, the how long you will be administrate determine the time of exposure of your box to your drugs. Postology. So biosecurity also is important, but I will not talk about that today. Now we need to know exactly how antimicrobial we use, they work. That will determine our ability or what will see our ability to, to at least bring something that work closely as antibiotic. So, you have, um, I was trying to, to draw something by myself. I found that we have a very nice diagram published uh, this year in January. So, microbes are more than host cells. So, in everybody, human, livestock, animal, our gut microbes are by far the most abundant. So we don't want to play with them too much. Uh, you don't want to play to make a dysbiosis. Dysbiosis is a control of symbiosis. So it's alteration of cat or debalancement of microflora. That will change completely the intestine homeostasis. So if you see the intestine, this is where the absorption are there. Nutrients are break down by digestion and absorbing depending on our need or poultry need. So here is what people are working hardly, hardly. The effect on anti, uh, antimicrobial and microbiota. And bacteria are by far the most abundant microbe in our gut. Little is done a, a, about the effect antimicrobial can have on host. This is very important to know. Because we believe, yes, we control bacteria grow and things like that, but what about animals themselves? We really need to understand that. And uh, to do that, you have different molecular method, metabolomic, transcriptomic, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, are all available now. Uh, but for any antimicrobial you use, bacteria react again. They react 
by activating resistance mechanisms to avoid their, their effect, inhibitory or killing. They can lower also their e energy tech level and their transform mechanisms to decrease their need, what they need for growth. So that can bile acid, cholesterol uptake, hormone, etc., etc. So those are all important bacteria react when we give them something they, they don't know or they don't like. So let's talk about cat microflora. It's very important, cat microflora in chicken. As, as I say, they are bacteria are abundant, but you have other archaea, proteins, fungi, and virus. Uh, the most abundant are bacteria, of course, and uh, bacteroides, lacto, bifido, clostridium, and anthrobacteria are the major one we, we can cultivate. But it doesn't mean they are the most abundant. And now we have much more method for other technique to quantify different bacteria, uh, bacteria in. A microbiome describe either the collective genome of the microorganism that resist in environment niche or in the environment themselves. So that includes all the genes that could be changed by uh, your intervention. And the microbiota have very benefit to human or to chicken, to animal, to everything. They provide vitamin, they prevent colonization by pathogen, so talk about probiotic, etc., etc. Antagonize with other bacteria by producing different substances, you call antibiotic or bacteriocyte or uh, weak, acid, uh, fatty, uh, weak fatty acid chain. So butyrate is one example, acetate is one example, propionate is one example. Stimulate the development of certain tissue. Uh, so again, we had a look at the stimulation of some mucosal antibody, okay, anti, uh, we say AGA, that agglutinate pathogen and kill them. So due to food safety, ecology, et cetera, et cetera, it's very important to know what's going on on, on, a, on a chick, chicken gut in order to develop an intervention strategy. Because the major disease in poultry production is any necrotic arthritis. I will not talk much more about that because you hear so many talk about that. I'm not a specialist of clostridium perfringens. But if you are more, you want more additional info, info, you should go to look at this book I published last year. Uh, here is some grading of NE that we've been able to see during our own so it comes of different level. You have foci that is isolated, that cause subclinical. Uh, you can some foci healing necrops, so they've been there, but they have some inexplanation, they become to heal themselves. You have confirmed necrosis. Of course, if you have that, it is fatal, so bear will not survive. And here is a typical bird when we are hit by any, so it's not a very good. And so far, producers were able to control by using antibiotics, such as bacitracin and virginamycin, to prevent it in the feed. So this is where we talk about antimicrobial use and resistance. Here is a picture of all antimicrobial use in Canada in animals in 2013. 1.6 million kilo of active ingredient of antimicrobial were used. 99% were for food production and 0.6% in company. This, some of them, or <coughs> even 68% of them, belong to the same class used also in human medicine. So that caused cross resistance. In broiler, our major topic uh, is 93% of all the feed are used to control Clostridium perfringens. Here are a list of all the feed additives used in Canada, approved by CFIA for broiler production. They are used for any prevention or for coccidiosis uh, or for growth promoter. Some have two claims. Prevent any and grow promoter. Take an example here. 
bacitracin we are talking about. It's growth promoter, prevent uh, any also. So if we say we don't like the term growth promoter, we have to remove it. Then go, that means bacitracin has to, to go. If, basit, if you remove bacitracin in intensive broiler production system, what we will do to prevent an event? And it's not, that is an example. So, under the pressure and press and everything, and animal wear people and uh, animal right people, producers are under pressure to just stop doing that using antibiotic. So in Canada, uh, due to antimicrobial resistance, category one uh, antibiotics are no longer used in Canada, in poultry. They plan to eliminate the preventive use of category two, that is antimicrobial by the end of, the, in category two you have penicillin, tylosine, et cetera, et cetera, and gentamicin. Uh, category three, that's where bacitracin is by 2020. So we need real to be ready by that time. If bacitracin is not longer allowed to be used in Canada, intensive broiler production will have a problem. So there is a high risk of tissues such as NA and coccidiosis in antibiotic free broiler, as we are already using in some country in Europe when they ban the use of antibiotic. So in 2014, when, 2004, when I've been moved from uh, 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 Lenoxville to Agassi to start working on poultry, we initiate this type of work uh, trying to see what are the effects of feed supplementation by, antimicro uh, by antibiotic or antimicro antimicrobial agent on the prevalence of resistance. So we screen uh, nine different farms, depending on what type of feed we are using. So here are the composition of different feed. So bacitracin is always here in every feed. Here is have to go help. And you have also Virginiamycin, virginiamycin is level one, uh, a category one class of antibiotic. It belongs to the same class as uh, 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 streptogramine, uh, streptogramine class. So uh, it's very important. It target uh, vancomycin resistance uh, in uh, vancomycin resistance enterococci in human, not virginomycin, but it equivalent in human production. So we collect about five, about 550 samples were collected uh, and uh, 61 samples by farm were analyzed. Here are the, resist, uh, the, level, the results in, for E. coli. These are the resistance level and these are the resistance pattern. Resistance level is how, what are the prevalences of resistance to specific antimicrobial agents. So you have amoxicillin, uh, ceftiofur, streptomycin, et cetera. Look at how beta lactam resistance were so high in our isolate. So if you look at the pattern, the pattern is the number of antibiotic to which I, each isolate could be resistant. So about 50% of all our E. coli were multi-resistance to 12 different antibiotics. With one resistance to 15. After, I will show you another result when that one was resistance to fairly different antibiotics. For Salmonella, it was not too bad, but again, safety of fuel resistance was high. And it was a significant difference between farmer who use different type of feed. But the question is, safety of fuel is not used as feed additive. It was used as preventive. So by injection to prevent colibacillus or uh, fev uh, we call uh, fever transport, et cetera, et cetera, but not as feed additive. Now it's not using anymore, but it will be good to restore the study, the same study after Removal of safety of fuel. 
Now, talking about this isolate that were 50 more resistant to more than 50 antibiotic. So we saw it when we were we considered as, as E. coli, and we did our technology that available to us at this time was microarray. So we use microarray to look at the gen, gen profile of that bacteria compared to all of it. We all of it. So we were surprised that, of course, poultry isolate closer together compared, they were completely different to bovine isolate 0157 for sure, so we will focus on that. And we call it ECD. It was previous, previously identified as E. coli and resistance to several. So we took it, we sequenced it by 454, and we analyzed it. The analyze turned out that it's not E. coli. It was by API 98% E. coli. But if you do sequencing and uh, you whole genome sequencing blasting, it turned up 99.9% E. ferfusonide. That became very interesting. It was resistant, so all the red are the resistant gene. All the blue are the virulent gene. But particularly, it was so many mobile genetic, including plasmid, phages, they were almost in, you can see it, I think those are phages, a lot of phages. So they play an important role for spreading antimicrobial resistance. So we analyzed f two larger plasmid we found it into that particular isolate. One we call it resistance plasmid, the second, we call it virulence plasmid. And it's very amazing that to see the virulence plasmid have the same virulence factor as EPEC. So that means iron uptake system, colonization factor, mobilization factor, and the resistance plasmid have all integral. So it becomes interesting. So we say, in this case, is that possible this can in, uh, uh, induce disease in, in chicks? Yes, it can induce chicks. This is the field isolate. This is the ECD uh, we call, and this is the K12. K12 is a known pathogenic E. coli. So after after 18 hours, after 24 hours, it killed 18% of, of the chicks, and after 48 hours, it killed 30% of the chicks. So we are here. This is the control, and this is the ECD. When we took all those birds, and we look at their internal tissue, we've been able to isolate this bacteria for all of them. So it can induce septicemia. So it became a health issue for uh, chicken, this type of. And we decide to see presently there are no clear identification method of Ferkisoni or Ferkisoni. So we decide to develop a detection method based on PCR, a multiplex PCR, conventional and real. This is conventional, this is real time PCR using four specific primer we couldn't find in any other species except uh, Ferkisonai. So we went to Fraser Valley again, contacted Chicken Marketing Board, enrolled about 32 different farmers to do our surveillance uh, or our sampling, two different times, two different cycles. Uh, for those who've been in British Columbia before on Fraser Valley, so that, that can remind you. Uh, so uh, we are almost here. Those are the east side. This is the highway one. By the way, it's a continuation of 407. 407 come until here. So if you take 407, uh, 401, you can go to British Columbia. But when you come to British Columbia, you change to highway one. The north and the south. The prevalence was so huge. We've been surprised to, to isolate this bacteria in almost all the farm. 
And on the north, we found a statistical difference between a uh, region they were much more prevalent in north than the other east, uh, south and east. No significant difference in terms of location and collection time. So co location is whether it is thicker or cloaca. And then we decide to screen all those for antimicrobial resistance. Here are the resistance pattern of uh, all the resist uh, septiophil resistance fercusoni we've been able to identify. You can see there are several, those who have only one resistance gene, two, three, four, five, until nine different resistance gene, and these are how they were distributed by region. And again, you can see north, north here was really something very important here, even here, but for here, we got about four or two isolate, having nine from the east region. Now, we change subjects and we talk about Salmonella. Salmonella is a zoonotic, you know, and antimicrobial resistance Salmonella is zoonotic. That you have a proof on that. So it's important, uh, but what makes the resist connection between antimicrobial use and salmonella resistance, we will see it later. So here is an example what type of study we did before. We did, uh, that is PFG on Hyderberg isolate during our survey, 15 different we isolate. And these are by PFG and these are the STIP done by uh, one of my high qualified person in bioinformatics in my lab. So you can see, Bioinformatics is much more accurate by discriminated isolate than PFGE that was considered gold standard at this time. So here you can see you have your two, two nice group, the same two nice group, but the isolate coming from the same farm cluster with others different. But here all the isolate from the same farm have a very nice group compared to uh, this is the reference here. So those isolate were all resistance to safety of fear. They have all ESBL, that is extending spectrum beta lactamase gene present. They were and one was resistance to septio so cep to cep ciprofloxacid. That is really, really interesting. Now stay with Heidelberg. Why Heidelberg? Because it's the, it one who is a focus of Health Canada PF now, and because he is also one who induced the much the more invasive salmonellosis in human, and the antimicrobial resistance also is becoming crazy for that. So we identified during that paper that either bear have a nuisial gene. was similar to glutathione transferase. Glutathione transferase is an equivalent of FOS A, phosphomycin resistance A. The equivalent or the similarity was about 78, 76%. <coughs> so we say, should we look at how important is that gene? Because phosphomycin is considered by clinicians to be reconsidered for last antibiotic to treat urinary tract infection by, by uh, multidrug resistance bacteria. So when we identify the, the gene, we try to look at how the genetic background of that. It's here, we call it folate 7, I will explain why later. But we also find integrase that mean it could be a gene that Salmonella Hyderberg kept it and integrated into his chromosome. We also had some genes that are related to phage. So that bring us the idea to think about, is that possible this gene come from phage? Not from phage, but when phage infect bacteria, when he lies with bacteria, he jumped to another one, and another one, and another one. 
And those fish are almost, uh, they target almost the same bacteria genus. So when we look at the phylogenetic tree with all the folks we saw, it stand alone, confirmed also by the alignment of the amino acid sequence that is here. So we call it fossil seven after the review, but our original name was not that. We call it FOS A, chromosomal Salmonella Heidelberg first detection. For me, that was the right name. But the review came up to say, oh, you should change it because the sixth one has been identified last year, so you should call that seven. And when it did seven, but everybody was not happy. But that's the decision of the editor, we go with that. Uh, so that gene, if you take it, cloning into a expression, pro, a expression vector and incorporate it into a salmonella enteritis with a MIC of two micrograms per ml, so that means free of all Fox gene, susceptible to phosphomycin, you screen it, the MIC jump from two to more than 10, 24 microgram per ml, that is huge, huge. To make sure that its resistance is real due by force, A, we use that test, the potentiation assay using for sodium phosphonoformate that inhibit specifically glycation transferase. So if you use that, you completely abolish the effect of the force, but if you don't, you have your, uh, you have your inhibitory zone here with in presence of phosphonoc that inhibit your gene. And here, this is uh, the, the gene. So when we screen the genome of about 42,000 isolate genome, we found it in 16 Heidelberg, four Agona, three Montefilo, two Tennessee, they were all positive to our things, so that means we will need to be vigilant when talking about using phosphomycin as last resort, both in human and in animal. Now we designed another study in Agassiz to see how specific antimicrobial use can have effect. Because from the first study, we cannot conclude anything. You see for one feed, you can see one or two different two or three different antibiotics. So you cannot really point up anything specific for that. So we went for that using different antibiotic and uh, in different, different pain, and uh, we, we collect the sample uh, weekly. We monitor the gulf, gulf head by uh, doing necropsy uh, or uh, scoring. Uh, we isolate E. coli, enterococci, Clostridium perfringens. We do our microflow, uh, micro DNA, and also we recently we use was sample to do metagenomic. Here are the effect of age. When bare age, you have a decrease of resistance. That is good to see. That means when bare are closer to our plate, they are less colonizing by antimicrobial resistance E. coli. But we, we have to be careful because the young birds are much more colonized by aerobic bacteria or proteobacteria, if we can say. And when they age, was, de was decreased little bit, little bit, little bit, little bit, and others, and uh, anaerobic bacteria would take over. So you see, it, like tobacillus, clostridia, etc. Et they will competition and compete compete with uh, E. coli and things like that. Now, if you look at this specific antibody, we were surprised to see that those who are using bacitracin or salinomycin have high level resistance to septiofur, spectinomycin, gentamicin. That was really a shock for us because we are not related. And we need to understand what's going on because Gentamicin or uh, bacitracin doesn't target E. coli, target gram-positive such as uh, enterococci. So why this one? Are you, are you killing all those 
gram positive and leaving the space for resistance bacteria? That is something we need to answer. Or is there competition between or a, a inability of uh, susceptible E. coli to compete with resistant bacteria when gram positive, uh, when uh, salinomycin and bacitracin are there? Those, all those questions need to be understand. Okay. We look at salinomycin, the sicker doing uh, metagenomic, so that's what I, you saw. And we were also see in salinomycin treatment, we have increase of bifido, clostridia, decrease E. coli, campylobacter, and salinomycin. So that answers some of the questions we had in our mind. What about resistance? Again, we see in indu induction of those who have salinomycin have isolate, we have more beta lactamase gene. So again, a lot of question is there. How really these things work have to be understood. Again, we say they will remove by 2012, all antibiotic, then we need to develop alternative method and to be ready. That uh, allow me to introduce that studies we had, uh, we published 2013, when we use a molecule we call cyclic DGMP. So you have one phosphor and one molecule, one phosphor and one molecule, we Together we put a cyclic. That is a really amazing molecule that has been discovered by Israeli people. Uh, it has been shown to, to modulate bacteria virulence factor, motility, biofilm formation, hemolyzing production. It's been also used, been shown to be a good adjuvant to clear mastitis and even uh, pneumonia in lung. So when I saw that, I say, okay, we should try it in chicken. So we took it in chicken, we used 20 nanomolar, we infect chicken, with, so we took chicken, we inoculate them on day 14, 15, 16, 17 with uh, Clostridium perfringens. It was a model very hard to establish because we want to have a non-invasive Clostridium model. So that we can look at the effect of Clostridium but not killing any animals. But we've been able to do it. Several tentatives, we've been able to develop that model and we look at the effect of that molecule on decreasing Clostridium. We were surprised to see it decrease Clostridium by intravenous, oops, intravenous administration uh, in SICA. And when we look at the prevalence of gene, we've seen also that a decrease of uh, Clostridium toxin gene was also determined there. So some potential is behind that. Unfortunately, I have to stop that job and move here, that work and move here. But if you are interested, I, I, still, I still have some interest on that. And uh, I'm not very proud of that, uh, this, this, because this is a very old method uh, we used to, when I was doing my, my PhD, to look at bacteria and things like that. But again, we've been, that was what we were available to us. We've seen that we control 92 two percent similarity between SICA of control on per 2021 20, and SICA of intramuscular cyclic treated on day 30. That means intramuscular injection doesn't affect the microflora according to that one. Second study for uh, another alternative is on cranberry. So here we publish this one 2010 when we try to incorporate cranberry in chicken feed, 
and look at how it could be a potential alternative. Why cranberry? Because it's known to, in to include a lot of good stuff. So you have phenolif, you have flavan, proampocyanin, A1, A2, those are very not and to be antimicrobial agent. Anti-inflammatory agent, terpen. Phenolic acid, again, antimicrobial. Over health related uh, in human, for example, to amphocyanin. Efflux pumps inhibitor, you see in Ferguson, they were full of full efflux pump. Efflux pump are genes that are evolved to pump up a uh, drug outside the bacteria and these become resistant. It's non specific. No significant effect we found on performances, some effect on gut microflora in terms of enterococci numbers, the carcass yet and the circumference and carcass proper, property, proximal property, that means protein, lipid, color, they were not affected, just to stay cheer force, they were not affected. Um, no significant effect on, on uh, any EN necrotic antiridate, but it was not real, not significant because we didn't have any with uh, more than two incidences of NE. But we were surprised to see those who receive cranberry at level doses for my 40 milligram per kilo of feed, we found 50% decrease of mortality for those who receive that. And as you know, the early mortality is attributed to poor eggs, a poor chicks quality. So the chicks come from hatchery, so you can have yolk sac retention or yolk have infection, cross spread, star hoof, deviation, and they are caused by a lot of things, including coliform stuff, pseudomonas, proteus, so, or mixing things. So probably, we are able to innovate those or to increase the immunity of chicken against those. So in conclusion, we could say antimicrobial modulate for sure gut microbiota and promote antimicrobial resistance. So that make the link between you control the gut health with using antibiotics, you promote antimicrobial resistance. Vigilance is recommending for emerging of new antimicrobial resistance bacteria we call about FOS A in Salmonella, Ferkusonide. Cyclic can be developed and very have a potential to be developed. Investigating the impact of feed additive have uh, on gut microflora and host could help developing approach to promote gut health while decreasing antimicrobial use and breaking down antibiotic. A lot of people work with, on that, with me uh, from university we have four universities uh, from UBC, uh, Sherbrooke University, McGill University, Dalhousie University, AFC scientists, a lot of people work on me, with me as also. Uh, industry uh, or federal, provincial, federal BC Ministry of Ag Agriculture on Land and J Industry, Rosebank and uh, Cresat, funding source. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Diora. I'm sure that you have lots of questions, but unfortunately, we have a classmate waiting really anxiously behind the doors to trying to get in. So I, I, I really have to, despite the fact that I'd love to have some questions from the audience, would I please ask you to join Dr. Diora maybe outside the room so that um, if you have any burning questions, I'm sure that you would be going in to entertain them, but unfortunately, you're going to have to vacate the room. Thank you very much. Thank again. you.